Now, you've seen some of our videos, and we use Getty Images uh, often, and so we thought it would be wonderful to have someone from Getty Images to talk about how they uh, manage their, their data and their images and how they do search. So here is flying from Southern California to join us today, Wendy Koo. Thanks, Margo. Today, I'll share about the end-to-end -end process of designing a machine learning application for deployment. A couple years ago, I was sitting at Mount Su and Wits, actually right over there in this first table, and I was so excited about the field. There are so many different problems across domains, and I just feel like this is something that I can do and keep me entertained until I'm 70. But I also have some questions about what the role of data science entail, and here are some of them. How is training a model for school projects or the WITS data fund different from doing that in industry? And does it make me a bad data scientist if I don't enjoy hyperparameter tuning? <laughs> I'll answer some of these questions throughout the talk. To set the stage, let's take a look at Getty Images' official search problem. Getty Images is a global official content creator and marketplace with over 500 million images and videos in editorial content, such as entertainment, sports, and news, as well as creative content that international firms and small businesses use for marketing. Each day, users conduct over 1 million searches on our site. And this is what an average user experience looks like. Users come to our site to search for images related to their brief, such as female engineer, they can use the side future panel to find that compelling image that tells their story. Then, once they find an image, they can use our recommended images in a similar image section to further explore and browse the library. A while back, users came to us asking, how can we make the similar image section more helpful? They're saying that these images don't look quite alike <laughs> to the original image that they interacted with. So as a data scientist in the search team, we're tasked with improving this feature. But what is a good similar image pair? Let's say the user interacted with the image in the middle. Which of these two images on the sides is a better fit to that? What about this one? <laughs> so at this point of the user journey, we know that the customer likes something about this image, but we actually don't know what they like about the image. In fact, two customers who have done the same search with the same search phrase and they interact with this image, they might like different things. A user might be looking for a dorky expression and will prefer the image to the left, while user B may be looking for a profile view of the horse against the blue sky and prefer the image to the right. Therefore, in the similar image problem, we'll focus on improving facial resemblance of the results while maintaining relevance. Now that we have some better understanding of the fuzzy similar image problem, we can decide on an, a modeling approach. Let's use the search query, person using phone in bed, as an example. And the in, image that the user interacted with is the one on the top right. We propose two methods. Method one is lexical similars. In this case, we can use the keywords that the photographers add to the original image and find other images that have similar keywords. And surprisingly, you can see that a lot of these images contain the same objects. However, depends on how keywords are set up, it's not guaranteed that the relationship between the objects are identical. For instance, the person might be using the phone next to a bed instead of in bed. Method two is semantic similars. We can pass the image through a facial model. By that, we'll get a facial embedding that represents the image. Then, we can use k-nearest neighbor to find other images with similar facial embedding. While the exact result depends on what facial model you use, in this case, you can see that the retrieved images are dark and they do look similar to the target image. However, we're losing the precision in a more inconsistent way. For example, some images might consist of more than one person, and the person might be using a laptop next to their phone instead of using their phone. Sometimes when making machine learning decisions, we're altering the user experience. 
you can see the results on the right-hand side are much more visually cohesive, and we're effectively narrowing and shifting the user search in two different ways. Therefore, in the planning stage, it's very important to work closely with products such that will anticipate and describe the expected outcome and choose a modeling approach that aligns with the user problem. With that, we can either use an off-the-shelf model for the official model, do transfer learning, or train this from scratch. However, the Getty Images corpus is slightly different from that of many open source data set. You can see that our data is all the way on the right. Our images are more artistic, and they can be more abstract. When making this decision, I find it helpful to evaluate on the incremental value of each method. This means asking myself and my team questions like, how will the feature look different if we were to use an off-the-shelf model versus an in-house model? With these considerations in mind, we also focus on validating the models and hypotheses as early as possible. So we decided on using the off-the-shelf model for a first test and validate that the customers actually care about facial similarity. At the same time, we'll fine tune this model with in-house data to further improve performance. We use five million image and metadata pair and fine tuning using a multi-GPU setup. For this project, we actually did not spend much time in hyperparameter tuning. We spent about half a day in a three month time to just try a couple of values using the learning rate scheduler. However, we've done a lot of data set experiments and model experiments. We've tried data set sizes of different sizes. We've tried noisier data, data with more confidence, and we also injected some images that are more expressive such as these images of bridges taken from less conventional angles. We found that data set experiments often more direct to improve model performance because they're in corpus. Now that we've trained an amazing model, the next step is to evaluate it. Since whether similar images is good is a subjective process, we propose a human in the loop evaluation process. Getty has one of the industry's largest and most experienced creative expert team. And to leverage the domain expert, we put together a 12-person cross-function evaluation team. Each similar image pair is rated by at least two evaluators based on relevance, whether the two images share the same main theme and key objects, and harmful, whether this image pair is harmful. And here you'll ask, what makes a recommendation pair harmful? And let's look at some examples. Is it harmful to compare a boy to a girl? Or a cool bird, comparing a cool bird to a cool person jumping into the ocean? Or this image of Central Park and an image of Changsha, a city in China? Or this drag performer to an actor getting ready for a show? Well, you might think these don't look harmful to me, but the answer actually depends. If the user is writing an article for New York City, it can be very unprofessional if they accidentally use an image for the wrong location. Therefore, in the evaluation process, while we've clearly defined a rating scheme for relevance, we decided to leave it more open-ended for harmful. We actually encourage our evaluators to decide for themselves and empathize with users what is a harmful scenario. And if at least one evaluator finds that data point to be harmful, we count that as a harmful case. Comparing the performance between a pre-trained model and our fine-tuned model, we were able to improve the ratio of good results and reduce the ratio of harmful results to as low as 0.06%. And with that, we recommended the model for the test. Another way to understand how, what information is learned in the fine-tuning process is to look at model performance at a topic level. In the scatter plot on the right, each dot represents a topic and the ratio of harmful results using the open source model and fine-tuned model. You can see majorities of these dots fall under the diagonal line. This means that these are cases when the fine-tuned model outperforms. 
And surprisingly, we've seen a lot of improvement in terms of illustrations and factors because these are data that are not common in open source data sets like MS Coco and Flickr 40K. In the bottom left corner, these are topics that both visual models do very well in. These topics are often more straightforward and more close to an object detection task, such as dog, person, bedroom. While on the top right corner, these are cases when both visual models do poorly. These are semantic concepts that, when represented in images, can look a lot like unrelevant images. For example, a costume of a mummy can kind of look like a stack of toilet paper rolls. Or other Halloween costume can also look like uniforms or traditional clothing. Therefore, we put together a different adversarial data set for training and validation to further improve the model. If this is a Kaggle competition, the good news is that we're done here. We have a great model, we have great metrics, we're good to go. But the blessing of being a real world machine learning application is that we can use other tools to enhance the solution. If a user do a search for Halloween and they came across some not safe for work car crash images in the results, it can be a potentially triggering experience. While we can use adversarial training data set to further improve that, but with a machine learning solution, we can never guarantee that these cases are fully eliminated. In this case, we use a rule-based method using the image labels to mitigate these risks, such that if the interactive image is related to Halloween, instead of using all images as candidates to be recommended, we will filter that and only show similar visual embedding images that also have the Halloween label. We're able to use the search taxonomy that we've built over the past decades to scale this to cover other not safe for work scenarios across different languages. However, it's very important to do this sparingly because as you can imagine, if we do this for every object, demographics, very quickly, this become lexical search again. And layering lexical search on top of semantic search will create other problems. We ship this semantic similar feature to the test and we've received positive results. We're able to improve user interaction rate by over 19% relatively. To sum up, these are some of the key lessons learned in developing machine learning applications. Set model objectives with customer problems in mind. Strategize on model evaluation early, not as an afterthought. And leverage non-machine learning methods when necessary. Remember the list of questions I shared in the beginning? I actually left with the one that I'm most self-conscious about. I was wondering if my creative background in arts would put me in a bad light as a data scientist. For a long time, I used to have this sticky note that reminds me not to use the word creative in interviews. And I was, and still am, a little worried that a beautiful PowerPoint would take away from the content of my talk and make me appear less competent or less smart in a STEM field. But over the years, I realized this might be a pro and not a con. I think it's evident that creative problem solving and design thinking supports a lot of my job, such as model iterations, experiments, and designing custom evaluation. The gap between a good machine learning model and a good machine learning application is the fit between the technology and the user problem, and how we handle these model outputs carefully with a lot of thought. Because as unassuming as these numbers are, <laughs> they're just numeric probabilities, and these are just image, music, product recommendations, we're affecting real people when we push these applications into the industry. So, the field of data science can benefit from having more diverse background and more voices. So here I encourage you to contribute your perspective, culture, and passion to the field, because this is what the field needs. Thank you so much. <laughs>